fell to his death this week while touring the Grand Canyon, walking across the viewing platform. Here's what we know. Crystal, welcome to the Grand Canyon Caverns uh, first level of our cave system. Wow. Scientists have recently discovered strange creatures lurking within the cavernous terrains of the Grand Canyon, and it's nothing like we've ever seen before. Now, if you look at how we positioned it on this display, you're like, wait a minute, the feet are kind of crooked. From beastly beings that will give you nightmares to ancient fossilized footprints from hundreds of millions of years ago, here are the top 10 finds in the Grand Canyon that astounded the world. All that are in the gifting of breath. Number 10, an ancient Egyptian civilization. Back in the early 20th century, a staggering discovery was made in the Grand Canyon. Until today, it has continued to fascinate and astound scientists worldwide. As the story goes, on April 5, 1909, a newspaper called the Arizona Gazette published a front-page article titled Explorations in the Grand Canyon. This all-revealing piece revealed that within the Grand Canyon, in a secret location where very few researchers have dared to venture, an ancient city was discovered, dated to be thousands of years old. The underground citadel, perched some 2,000 feet above the Colorado River, was said to have produced artifacts, hieroglyphics, and even mummified remains which were identified to be of Egyptian origin. This mysterious site was said to have been discovered by a Smithsonian-funded explorer named G. E. Kincaid, who embarked on the daring ex expedition under the guidance of a professor named S. A. Jordan. At the time the discovery was made, it was deemed the oldest archaeological site in the United States, and some even took things further by naming it the most valuable site in the world. As the men traveled deeper into these delicately hewn caverns, they were said to have discovered an interesting spectacle, a cross-legged idol resembling Buddha, sitting quietly in a tomb filled with mummified human remains. This further complicated an already mysterious find, and as expected, it raised a couple of eyebrows. Other artifacts discovered at the site include copper weapons, granaries filled with seeds, and several other statues. With its size, the cavernous city was said to have housed up to 50,000 inhabitants in its heyday. When news of this discovery broke in 1909, it caused a massive sensation. Both amateur archaeologists and seasoned scientists were divided along the lines of reason and skepticism. On one hand, some believed that such a discovery was indeed a reality, while on the other hand, there were the unbelievers who began to punch holes in the story. Not surprisingly, the more the tale was examined, the clearer it was that this might just be another massive hoax. For one, the Smithsonian Institution, which was said to have funded the expedition, claimed it had no record of any scientist by the name G. E. Kincaid or even the supervising professor S. A. Jordan. To counter these claims, the believers argue that their names were purposely wiped out of the history books so as to protect this long-guarded secret, which didn't fit into the established timeline of human civilization. But that's not the only fact that makes this story seem more like fiction than reality. You see, even even though the paper claimed that several Egyptian artifacts were discovered at this strange site, none of these finds were ever released to the public. So there's no concrete evidence as to whether such a location was indeed real. Then of course, there's the voice of reason, which calls to question the possibility of an Egyptian civilization existing in a place as far as Arizona. How did the ancient Egyptians travel all the way from a different continent to establish their reign in the canyon? More importantly, why? Regardless of these obvious flaws in the story, many continue to hold on to claims that this was a real discovery and that the backlash was sponsored by the government, who instituted a massive cover-up for reasons unknown. Till today, Kincaid and Jordan's discovery continue to ignite controversy and debate, and it remains one of the wildest stories to ever come out of the Grand Canyon. Number 9. Ancient Fossil Footprints about 313 million years ago, a large reptile crawled up a coastal sand dune in what is now known as the Grand Canyon. Few moments after this legendary walk, a light dew wetted the tracks, followed by a wind-blown sand, forever etching these clawed footprints for ages to come. Then, in 2016, a Norwegian geology professor by the name of Alan Krill was leading his students along the same path, now known as Bright Angel Trail, as they partook in their annual field trip to the Grand Canyon. But nothing could have prepared the professor and his students for the astounding discovery they were about to encounter. Buried within a fallen boulder were these same tracks, imprinted ages ago, but so well-preserved, they looked like they were made just yesterday. Out of curiosity, 
Professor Krill took a picture of the prints and sent them over to his friend, Steve Rowland, a geologist who often accompanied the group on their yearly trip. After deeply inspecting this alluring archaeological piece, Rowland was able to determine that the creature was most likely the size of a modern-day chuckwalla, which is typically between 15 to 13 inches long. The analysis also showed that the prints were made by two different creatures, likely of the same species, although the timing of the second imprint was most likely later than the first. The boulder itself was determined to have fallen from a nearby cliff exposure of the Manacock Formation, a revelation which helped determine the age of the prints. The most intriguing aspect of this discovery, however, is that it helped scientists peer back into millions of years, exposing new clues as to the evolution of amniote. Previously, researchers had believed that these special breeds of animals required water to survive and proliferate. But after discovering their tracks in what was a coastal dune, we can now conclude that these amniotes adapted to land as soon as they evolved. On the other side, there's also the unique lateral sequence gait with which this animal walked, which has remained a vital part of the physiology of many animals today. To explain the lateral sequence gait simply, picture your pet dog or cat, especially when they're moving slowly. The right rear leg is always followed by the right front leg, and then the left rear leg follows the left front. This is unlike the diagonal sequence employed by humans, where our left arms swing forward, synchronized with our right leg, and vice versa. For years, archaeologists have struggled to establish the exact moment in evolution when living organisms on Earth evolved the lateral sequence gait, with many placing the timeline at just a few million years ago. However, after discovering this particular print dated to 313 million years ago, it's safe to conclude that the locomotive pattern evolved much earlier than previously believed. Of the many interesting discoveries made in the Grand Canyon, this has captivated the attention of the scientists scientific community more, and it has been regarded as the oldest recorded vertebrate track ever discovered in the ancient landscape. Number 8. Shasta Ground Sloth Remains did you know that during the Grand Canyon wasn't always this arid wasteland? During the last ice age, this monumental landscape was quite cooler and wetter than it is today, allowing the growth of lush vegetation throughout the region. This provided a perfect habitat for large mammals like the Shasta ground sloth, a special species of mammals which have now been lost to the brutal grips of extinction. Although modern humans never got the opportunity to meet this fascinating animal, the Grand Canyon perfectly preserved some remains that offer us a glimpse into the physiology of this species. Back in July 1936, the National Park Service sent several specialists including archaeologist Mark Raymond Harrington and geologist Edward Schenck to check out one of the many caves in the Grand Canyon that's famed for being home to Shasta ground sloth fossils. The cave, known as Rampart Cave, has delivered countless fossilized remains and dunga belonging to the Shasta ground sloth since exploration began at the site. The July 1936 expedition was the first time archaeologists ventured into the caverns, and what they found was nothing short of astounding. The Rampart Cave was like a treasure trove, delivering hundreds of fossils. This was soon surpassed by the 1942 excavation, which was conducted under the supervision of Remington Kellogg of the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of Natural History. Kellogg and his team were able to identify several materials in the cave, offering us an insight into the physiological structure of this extinct species. A deep exploration of the Rampart Cave revealed that it had been used by the sloths for thousands of years. Apart from heaps upon heaps of sloth dung, the archaeologists were also able to locate several remains of this species, including skulls, bones, hair, skin, sinew, and other soft parts. The Shasta ground sloth itself is a pretty interesting animal, which would probably not fit into our world today. Now, if you look at how we positioned it on the display, you're like, wait a minute, the feet are kind of crooked. Unlike the modern tree sloths that we have today, these ground sloths were very large, and some even grew to the size of elephants. However, the Shasta ground sloths that inhabited the Rampart Cave were actually quite small, about the size of a bear, which is still quite huge considering the size of the modern tree sloths. However, a little dark cloud surrounds this story. You see, according to findings made by scientists, these animals were likely driven to extinction by human activities rather than climate change. Scientists postulate that the Shasta ground sloth was wiped out due to excessive hunting which further exacerbates the role man 
and plays in the state of our world today. Even though we may never get to see the Shasta Ground Sloth ever again, the Grand Canyon has preserved these ancient remains as a sort of time capsule, offering us a trip back to the time when these fascinating animals dominated the landscape. That dung made it clear that these creatures are vegetarians, so they doubtless use those claws. Number seven, split twig figurines. Some 4,000 years ago, prehistoric humans occupied the rugged terrains of the Grand Canyon, living in groups, hunting, and proliferating. Although the process of determining when exactly humans began to make the canyon their home is pretty tricky, scientists have been able to uncover several pieces of evidence of human existence in the region, offering us a glimpse into what life was like thousands of years ago. One of such findings was these split twig figurines, which were discovered in several caves of the canyon. The first of these figurines were found in a gorge of the Colorado River. Thank you. The Colorado River is the lifeblood of the Grand Canyon region. And in a shallow rock shelter in Walnut Canyon, just east of Flagstaff, Arizona. Back in the 1930s, researchers began stumbling upon these ancient relics, and confusion instantly set in as to how long ago these things were left behind. The figurines were carefully crafted by twisting and wrapping split willow twigs in the semblance of four-legged animals. And according to carbon dating analysis, they're estimated to be over 4,000 years old. Back when this discovery was first made, it challenged the preconceived notion of when human activity began to evolve in the canyon. Evidence of human occupation of the the canyon dates back to way over 4,000 years ago. And as far as scientists can tell, these figurine makers simply appeared around 4,000 years ago and then promptly disappeared from the evolutionary tree. Then there's also the question of purpose. Why were these figurines made? Did they hold any cultural or spiritual significance to the people who made them? Or were they simply toys? woven in moments of artistic inspiration. To be honest, no one has really been able to figure that out yet. However, we do have some assumptions. According to some scientists, these twig figurines were part of an elaborate hunting ritual, a means of ensuring every hunting expedition resulted in bountiful catches, providing enough good for the early human communities. Many of the caves where these figurines were found also contained Pleistocene remains of big game animals, further proving that these artifacts were indeed part of a hunting ritual. On the wild side, though, there are those who claim that those hunter-gatherers who called these caves home believed that these were entrances to the underworld. Today, these split-twig figurines are a testament to the artistic intelligence of the early humans. Even in their crude state, our prehistoric ancestors were able to craft such interesting pieces, which have endured for thousands of years and will most likely continue to astound us for thousands more. If you had fun making your split-twig figurine, be sure to visit the Arizona State Museum's website. Number six, ancient rock art. The ancient civilizations that dominated the Grand Canyon may have died off thousands of years ago, but these enduring artworks keep their memory alive. Scattered throughout this fascinating landscape are rock art of all forms, crudely and carefully drawn by the early humans who once inhabited these rocky terrains. Not much is known about these people, but these clues left behind tell us part of their stories. Wall and boulders scattered throughout the canyon act as canvases, where these prehistoric artists expressed their creativity and etched their enduring stories for generations to come. Rock art in the canyon is divided into two categories. There are the pictographs, which were constructed using pigments extracted from plants, and then there's the petroglyphs, which are rock carvings or etchings made by chipping away dark desert varnish to expose the lighter rock beneath. If you're wondering what desert varnish is, it's that thin black layer which covers the surface of many rocks found in the desert southwest. These ancient humans were able to figure out how to manipulate these rocks to create lasting artworks that have captivated and astounded us for many years. While some of these rock arts are easy to interpret, others seem to depict cryptic messages which are pretty hard to decipher, while some of these arts are simply abstract and subject to personal interpretation. A short walk through the infamous Bright Angel Trail in the Grand Canyon will transport you back in time, through years of human history. Just before passing through the first or upper tunnel, there's a remarkable gallery of deer pictographs painted in red onto a band of rock, just beneath an overhanging ledge. These deer pictographs are believed to have been left by the ancestral occupants of the canyon as a way of marking their path down into the side canyon. This is the infamous Mallory's Grotto, which dates back to about 4,000 years 
years ago, the ancient rock art contains elements from the Archaic period with an integration of the Kohonia culture. The charcoal inscriptions on the walls are said to have been made by the Havasupai tribe, one of the oldest continuously existing tribes in the Grand Canyon. Havasupai Falls is an iconic natural landmark at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. This particular route was used by the Havasupai people, who lived and farmed at the Indian Garden, down in the relatively flat riparian area, some 3,000 feet below the canyon rim. Unfortunately, after the Grand Canyon was declared a national park, the Havasupai were barred from their ancestral home, forced to abandon their heritage and seek refuge in other parts of the canyon. Their rock art, along with those made by the prehistoric humans who came before them, stand as eternal monuments, which continue to fascinate us today. Before we uncover more astounding discoveries, here's our subscribers' pick for today. You won't believe what just emerged from the Grand Canyon shocked the world. Feast your eyes on this disturbing image of a gigantic humanoid recently discovered in the National Park, a figure arousing both curiosity and terror. For centuries, there have been debates surrounding the existence of giants or Nephilim in the Grand Canyon long before humans came. Legendary tales speak of these beings, which stand at over 10 feet tall, towering above the horizon and striking terror in the heart of the wildlife that dominated the region. But there's more. This discovery has since been shut behind classified files, shielded from the public eye. While many have been fascinated by this find, others have remained skeptical about the existence of such a magnificent beast. Which of these discoveries shocked you the most? Share your thoughts with us in the comments section. Now, let's get back to the video. Number 5. Grand Canyon Caverns Back in 1927, a man named Walter Peck was on a treasure hunt looking for gold in the Grand Canyon when he stumbled upon something absolutely astounding. Located just a few miles east of Peach Springs, Peck found himself in what came to be known as the Grand Canyon Caverns, some of the largest dry caverns in the United States. Sitting at an elevation of about 5,500 feet, with a depth of over 210 feet, the cave system is one of the most fascinating features of the Grand Canyon. Even though Peck didn't exactly find gold. His search brought him a treasure, and with an astute business acumen, he was able to turn the cave into a tourist attraction. Soon, travelers were trooping to this new, wondrous site, paying a token of 25 cents for an immersive experience, which includes the view of a purported caveman. However, there is another twist to this story. These cavemen turned out to be two inhabitants of the cave, who had died in the winter of 1917 to 1918. The men were said to have been harvesting and cutting firewood on the hilltops when a snowstorm struck unexpectedly. The men decided to take shelter in the cave, and for the next three days, they were subjected to a bitter cold. The two brothers eventually died from influenza, and since the ground was frozen solid, they were buried within the caverns before their remains were discovered and properly identified. In 1935, the Civilian Conservation Corps and Works Progress Administration established an agreement with Peck to build a new entrance to the caverns. Then again, in 1962, a 210-foot shaft was blasted into the limestone, and an elevator was installed. Today, the caverns remain one of the hottest tourist attractions in the canyon. Canyon, as thousands of visitors troop in to explore the hidden crevices, and the area now includes a hotel, an RV park, campgrounds, a restaurant, and even a convenience store. Number 4. Uranium. This next discovery actually takes things to a worrisome level. You see, although the Grand Canyon has been a haven for various Native American tribes since time immemorial and the crown jewel of our national park system, it has also been subjected to exploitation for many, many years. Since the 1950s when the precious material uranium was first discovered at this site, the canyon and its inhabitants have endured untold damage due to the unbridled mining that goes on in this place. Uranium in the Grand Canyon was first discovered in the Orphan Copper Mine, situated near the south rim of the canyon back in the year 1950. The area had been designated as a private property since 1906 and has remained so even today. As soon as this first site was discovered, uranium started turning up in other collapsed breccia pipes in northern Arizona. These breccia pipes, which are formed when overlying rocks collapse into caverns, were formed in the Mississippian Redwall limestone and are typically about 300 feet in diameter. For years after this discovery was made, several indigenous tribesmen who earn their livelihood in this region have called for a cessation to the mining activities all that are in the gifting of breath. Which not only threatens the ecosystem, but is also gradually infringing on their heritage. 
Native communities, local governments, hunters, and conservation groups have campaigned unrelentingly against the exploitation, calling for a temporary mining ban around the Grand Canyon for years. In 2012, this movement seemed to make a headway after Interior Secretary Ken Salazar issued a 20-year ban on mining in the region, blocking new efforts to mine uranium on one million acres of public land within and surrounding the Grand Canyon. But was this ban truly effective? Well, not in the least. You see, even though on paper it seems as though the battle against the constant exploitation has been won, reality paints a very different picture. As of the time of making of this video, there are still nearly 600 mining claims on national forests and other public lands around the Grand Canyon, despite repeated attempts by the legislature to permanently ban new mining around the park. The advocacy continues, but it's an uphill battle. However, for the tribes who call the canyon home, it's a fight they can't afford to lose, as the effects of continued mining would be devastating both on the environment and the cultural heritage that have endured for generations. Number 3. New Insect Species Away from the doom and gloom and the archaeological discoveries, scientists have also stumbled upon several odd creatures which had previously remained undiscovered. Believe it or not, what just emerged from the Grand Canyon shocked the world. In a cave on the north rim of the Grand Canyon, these never-before-seen creatures have evolved away from the outside world, and they are as weird as can be. The most interesting of them all are the accurately named pseudoscorpions, which bear a striking semblance to the typical scorpions of the wild, except for a few differences. You see, owing to the fact that these strange creatures evolved in total darkness, they have adapted by losing their eyes. Unlike the true scorpions, they also do not possess a stinger in their pincers, which is pretty strange. According to J. Judson Wynn, an assistant research professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at Northern Arizona University, who conducted an extensive study on these creatures, these new species are unlike anything we've ever seen or heard of. He further emphasized that the cave, which housed these pseudoscorpions for centuries, has produced the widest diversity of cave-adapted arthropods of any known cave in the canyon. The researchers first discovered these interesting species during an expedition between 2005 and 2007, but it took years before the species were determined to be unique. The creatures have now been taxonomically identified as Hesperochines bradybauhii and Tuberochernus coni, respectively. They're typically about 0.12 inches long, and their desired menu includes tiny invertebrates like springtails, book lice, mites, and possibly some cricket nymphs, all of which are just one-fourth the length of a grain of rice. However, the strangest facts about these pseudoscorpions are their social behaviors. According to scientists, these fascinating creatures use their pincers to hitchhike to new locales. They will grasp onto other animals such as birds, mammals, and even other insects, effectively transporting themselves over great distances without the stress of having to walk all by themselves. With this unique behavior, pseudoscorpions are able to utilize other animals as vehicles, helping them move faster than they ordinarily could. It also allows them to mate and disperse their genes farther than they can when walking on their own legs. Number 2. The Grand Canyon Pink Rattlesnake The Grand Canyon is home to a wide variety of snakes. However, the only species that is considered to be poisonous is the rattlesnake, which can be found in massive numbers at different locations around the canyon. There's the Mojave Green, the Great Basin, the Southwestern Speckled Rattlesnake, the Northern Black-Tailed Rattlesnake, the Hopi, and the most interesting of them all, the Pink Rattlesnake. These snakes can be found within the area of the Inner Gorge, and within the corridor of the Colorado River. Of these six species, the pink rattlesnake is the only one which cannot be found anywhere else in the world except within the Grand Canyon. Its pink-like coloring was an evolutionary feature, which helped it blend into the inner region of the gore, unnoticed by both predator and prey. Even today, visitors to the park are sometimes oblivious to the snake's presence, owing to its unique camouflage. However, the pink rattlesnake is quite docile and will not go out of its way to attack humans unless it feels threatened. Pink rattlesnakes are usually anywhere from 16 to 54 inches in length and pack a great punch. When they do decide to strike their prey, these highly venomous snakes leave no room for survival. Scientists have established a linkage between the pink rattlesnake and two other snake species, including the western diamondback and the pit viper. They're greatly feared and are best left alone if encountered in the wild. Number 1. Indigenous Tribes of the Grand Canyon 
Did you know that there is a tribe within the Grand Canyon with over 300,000 individuals? Strange, right? Before the Grand Canyon became a national park, several indigenous tribes had established their communities in the region for over 1,000 years. While it may seem inconceivable that such a desolate wasteland would be home to a teeming human population, it is in fact very true. Today, there are six main tribes that still inhabit the territories within and around the Grand Canyon, and much of the land outside of the National Park remains tribal lands. For these local tribes, the Grand Canyon is more than a tourist attraction or an archaeological wonderland. It is home, a spiritual place, where their culture and traditions have been established since time immemorial. To the outsider, this might be a picturesque location for an epic Instagram photo, but for these guys, it's a place that holds both cultural and spiritual significance. The six tribes generally associated with the Grand Canyon are the Hualapai, Havasupai, Navajo, Hopi, Paiute, and the Zuni tribe. Each of these groups have resided on the Colorado Plateau long before the Europeans came, and each boasts their own distinct culture and heritage, as well as a non-severable connection to the Grand Canyon. The Hualapai have inhabited the canyon for hundreds of years, and today their population is estimated to be about 2,300. The name Hualapai translates to people of the pine, which is quite appropriate considering the large pinyon juniper forest they historically inhabited during the fall and winter seasons. The Hualapai are apportioned up to one million acres of land, and they remain one of the largest indigenous tribes in the canyon. Then there's the Havasupai, known as the people of the blue-green waters. Their name stems from the beautiful waterfalls of the Havasu Canyon, which is the tribe's ancestral home and their main source of industry, wealth, and tourism. At one point in history, the Hualapai and the Havasupai were one single tribe. However, according to oral history, the two split off due to a lack of resources. Today, the Havasupai consists of about 400 members, many of whom continue to carry on the legacy of their ancestors within the canyon. The Navajo tribe is perhaps one of the largest, with over 300,000 members. As a matter of fact, their sheer size has also earned them the recognition as the largest reservation in North America. Historically, this special indigenous tribe were hunters and gatherers who adopted farming practices from the local Puebloan tribes and later integrated livestock farming into their lifestyle. The Navajo Nation extends beyond the boundaries of Arizona, spreading into New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah, with over 16 million acres of land to their name. Thank you for watching this video. See you in the next one.